So welcome everyone to our final data skills uh, webinar of the spring um, semester, so to speak. And this last one will be on working with AOP's hyperspectral data in Google Earth Engine. So before we get started, Neon does have a code of conduct and uh, we encourage you to explore more at the URL at the bottom. I'll be sharing a lot of little tiny URLs throughout the uh, webinar today. So um, please, look at those as you as you see fit. But just briefly, uh, NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation. And listed below are some of our um, values that we ask you to respect and follow while you're participating in any NEON event and working with NEON data generally. All right, so in this webinar, um, I'll just walk you through what we'll be covering, but we'll give a brief introduction to AOP's hyperspectral data set. This is just very condensed, so we do assume you have some previous knowledge of hyperspectral data, and we have a lot of resources that if, uh, to point you to if you don't um, have that background. And then um, we'll give some updates on our efforts to add our AOP data to Google Earth Engine. And then we'll get into a live coding section, um, which will be the majority of the workshop. And that will be about uh, 45 or 50 minutes. Um, and we'll leave five minutes at the end of the hour for survey, uh, which we'd ask you to fill out. So NEON is constantly um, trying to improve our workshop offerings and, and uh, educational resources. And so we'd like your feedback on that. Um, and then as John put in the chat, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to pop it into the chat and he'll be monitoring that. Um, and then we can uh, we can address any longer questions at the end. And um, if, I think we're getting a few more people in the waiting room. So John will be adding those people as well. And then lastly, at the um, from 1 to 1.30 Mountain Time, we'll leave some time for questions and answers. And I'll also uh, give a shout out to Kel Markert, who's from Google, and he's a um, he's been helping us get our data into Earth Engine, and he's the expert on um, Earth Engine coding and all that. So we're lucky to have him here today to be able to answer questions as well. All right. So in a nutshell, um, this is our neons. Imaging spectrometer, we call it NIS. We use a lot of acronyms, but we basically are flying our plane along in a um, in like a line mowing the lawn pattern, and uh, we collect the data in a push broom configuration. So we're collecting data at a thousand meters above ground level, and this allows us to get one meter squared uh, spatial resolution, and then we collect. Uh, bands between 380 to 2500 nanometers. So that's from the visible to the shortwave infrared portion of the spectrum. And each of our bands has about five nanometer width to it. So this is very high spatial and spectral resolution, especially compared to satellite data. And we have a lot of requirements that we follow while collecting our data. Um, our first requirement being that we aim to collect only in clear sky conditions with less than 10% cloud cover. Um, so the photo on the right is would not be a great flying day, um, but that we might have to fly in conditions like that if we don't have any other opportunities. Um, we also fly, each of our sites typically covers a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer spatial area. Um, and these are for our main terrestrial sites. And then lastly, we fly at what we call peak greenness, which is when the uh, leaves are most, most the leaves on the trees are most photosynthetically active. Um, and this is to try and obtain consistency between collections from year to year. And um, John Musinski made this nice app, but uh, we seek out those peak greenness con conditions by looking at satellite data um, year over year. And that's how we optimize our uh, schedule. And then lastly, this is just a really brief picture of what you might be able to detect, do to detect using hyperspectral data. So on the left is a false color image of using our spectral data of an area that has been um, had a major fire. This is the Miriam fire in Washington state. And the spectral curves on the right 
show you what you might see. The green curve shows what you might see with a healthy vegetation with a nice spike in the near infrared portion or the red edge portion of the spectra. And then the red curve here shows what you might see with a burned area, the spectra of a burned area. And we'll get into this in a little bit in the code, but I just wanted to give a, a, a high level overview of kind of some of the things that you can image with hyperspectral data. So I know that was quite the whirlwind, but like I mentioned, the NEON website and our um, tutorial page has a lot of a lot more detailed um, resources going into this. Okay, so for those of you who have been um, following AOP and our work on getting data into GEE, I'll just give a brief update on where we are. So we are currently working on ingesting um, five of our data products, our EOP data products, um, into Google Earth Engine. And these are the bi-directional surface reflectance or hyperspectral data product. And that's the product that we're going to go into today. And then we're also ingesting three of our LiDAR rasters, the digital terrain, digital surface models, and then the canopy height model or ecosystem structure data product. And then finally, our RGB camera imagery. So to start, we don't have all of these data products ingested so far, but we do have a small subset that we have to work with, and we're planning on rolling out the rest of the data throughout the rest of the year and potentially into next year. Uh, we're not totally sure how long that will take at this point. Um, and I'll show you this link in a little bit, but the uh, we do have a little tutorial app that shows what we currently have ingested, and I'll also go through that in the live coding um, to give you a preview. Um, so our data are not currently searchable in the GEE public data sets, but we are actively working on this and expect it to be done uh, no later by the end of June. So um, this has been several years in progress. Uh, John Musinski has been working on this for, uh, I don't know exactly when he started, but uh, we have gotten AOP data in and we have some pilot, had some pilot data sets in before this year, um, but the, we have a few updates this year that we're excited about. The main one being that we are working on getting these into the public Earth Engine data catalog. So then, so people can search for it in the same way they would search for other satellite data sets. And then we've also added to our um, data. So the, the main addition is that we've added in some QA bands um, that this lesson will go through. And these allow you to uh, find and understand the data sets in the way that they're intended. So um, things like the weather quality information and uh, more details about the data sets and the, and the descriptions of the metadata and all that. So we do have a number of educational resources, um, and this is also we're in we're currently working on updating our resources that we created last year for this newer data set and to introduce the public data. Um, but the tutorials that we have last year are created are 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 uh, available in a series that is still relevant and it has a lot of um, code that you may find useful. There just may be small tweaks to it that we adjust. As we um, as we get this this new data set in, and then we also have a couple of new tutorials for this workshop um, that we'll cover. And if you want to follow along on the website, um, if that's easier for you, um, you can use these links below. Um, and the first one that we'll be going into is this intro AOP GEE 2023. Um, John, if you get a minute to add that to the chat, that would be great. The, these two URLs at the bottom here. And then, um, as I mentioned, we will be adding, um, we will be updating our old tutorial series, tutorial series to reflect the changes that we've implemented this year. All right, one second. Okay, with that, um, to get started, hopefully everyone got a chance to register for Earth Engine. And you can use this tiny URL here, and that will open up a, a repository in Google Earth Engine. And that's where we'll be working from today. So I'll go ahead and copy this into the chat. And uh, everyone can click on that link and authenticate. Thank you, John. 
and then we will um, we will get started with the live coding. So I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to do that, and I'll click on the link myself. Actually, I think I have it open. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my code editor now. And just okay. to interject, um, <clears throat> you all should be able to find these under um, in the scripts panel um, to the upper left. Um, and then the list of the scripts should be under reader, not code. under only. Yeah, so uh, it would be under, if you can see where my my mouse is here, it would be under this reader, and then it would show up under users. Yeah. B pass, and then um, Neon AOP intro. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Okay, so I'll go ahead and just give a really brief um, overview of the code editor. And we do encourage everyone to explore the Google Earth Engine developer resources. They have a lot of information on working in the code editor, and some sample scripts and things like that. Um, so to start, I'll just, I'll just start with all the panels. But if you haven't worked in Earth Engine, it's pretty similar to a lot of other um, IDEs or interactive development environments, where there's a, a, a handful of different panels, there's different tabs. And um, the main difference is that there's this nice map panel in the bottom that hopefully will look familiar to you from Google Maps or Google Earth Engine. So as, as John mentioned, the scripts is where you can create new scripts that will actually populate in this middle window here. And these are integrated with um, Git, and, um, but it's actually managed through Google Earth Engine. So basically how I shared the repo with you earlier was through this and you can do the same thing you can create a new git repository and then share with um, with your colleagues or anyone in this way so it makes it really nice for creating and sharing uh, code there's documentation in this docs tab so you can search for um, let's say anything you're trying to do i'll just show image collection because that's what we'll start with um, hold on you might have to scroll down. And then lastly, there's the assets. And this will look different for you, but this is where you can add your own data sets or see what data sets are already in your, um, your repository there. The code, the main um, section where you'll be interactively coding is in this middle window here. Uh, I'll just mention um, to hit save, because if you try to exit out of a code and you haven't saved, it will prompt you. And then on the right, we have things like the inspector, the console, which is where if you pr make print any statements to try and troubleshoot your code or things like that, that will appear in the console. And then tasks, and these have things like, um, in my case, uh, we've been ingesting some data, so that would have tasks like that, but I think it would also have exports and other things. And then finally down here, we'll explore this a little bit later, but there's, there's an interactive map panel uh, with some, Things you can add in a marker to get geometry, add in polygons, move around, and then there's a layers option that will show up a little bit later. So um, I'll just get started with this first script, and you'll see that um, there's a lot of green text in here, and this is all just comments. And so just a quick keyboard shortcut if you do control and then forward slash, that will comment or uncomment a section. So as we're going through, I'll, uh, a lot of these, a lot of this code at the bottom has been commented out. And to go line by line, um, I'll just start on commenting and then explain what the code does. We try to do live coding when we can, but I think in this case, um, to avoid typos and things like that, we'll just stick with this method. So let's see what we're doing. 
Um, and I'm not, not going to go too much into the details of the JavaScript syntax. Um, Google Earth Engine, especially or particularly in this platform, uses the JavaScript API. Um, but I will just cover some basic things here um, as we go through. So uh, all, the, all of the syntax basically starts with declaring a variable. And here, all I'm doing is reading in image collections, uh, knowing the path. So currently, all of our AOP data is saved in this in this project called Neon Prod Earth Engine, and then under Assets, and we have the data product identifier. And if you're familiar with the Neon data from the data portal, this follows the same naming convention that you can find that data. So first, I'm reading in this SDR or Surface Directional Reflectance collection as using this image collection and then pointing to the path. And then I'm doing the same for all of the other data sets. So the RGB camera, this is the data product ID 30010, the canopy height model that has the data product ID 30015, and then the DEM, which is the digital terrain and digital surface model as a double band image. And then uh, we're reading that in. So um, I just see from the chat that we have at least one person who can't access the data. Uh, so perhaps John can reach out to her. I don't know if everyone's having this problem, but we did provide read access to everyone. So it could just be um, a registration or authentication issue. All right, I'll go ahead and continue. Um, so you'll see that all of these variables are underlined and there's this little prompt that says SDR coal can be converted to an import record. So if you convert that, you'll see that the variable pops up at the top of the script. And then here you can click on this link to the data product ID. And then if you click on the image tab, you should actually be able to see all of the images that are loaded in the uh, in this image collection. So you can see we don't have a ton right now, but we do have some from various sites. And if you click on the image ID in here, you can see the path to that direct image. So we encourage you to explore this, and this is one way to see if the data set you're interested in is currently in Google Earth Engine. And we'll show you another way to do that shortly as well. Um, so just a quick trick, if you click Control Z um, or undo, that will bring that variable back in. And we just recommend if you're sharing scripts with anyone to make sure to have those variable declarations to the data sets directly in the script. Because otherwise, if it's only saved up here, um, if you share that script, those variables will not be shared with the script. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, you may first be interested to see what variable or what um, data sets are currently available in Earth Engine since we haven't ingested all of them. And so all I did here was I uncommented this second check chunk of uh, code from lines 13 to 15. And I'm, uh, the print statement is a nice way to um, just show what you have in the console. So if I do this and click run, I'm printing out the images in the SDR collection. And if I expand this and expand this window, you can see here a list of all of the images and the information that you're, we're most interested here at the end is the year site visit and then the data set. So in this case, these are all SDR data images. And so this is the full list of the data that we have currently in GE. All right, we have some, some people um, who, are, who are trying to follow along and aren't able to access the script. And yeah, first make sure that you um, are able to get into the Earth Engine code editor. Um, and that just requires your login information. So if you haven't yet registered, for Earth Engine, um, that would definitely be a reason you can't access this um, quote editor. And uh, Kel's giving some 
tell him John or give me some um, helpful tips in the chat as well. Maybe we could pause for just one minute um, sure. to see if uh, anyone who is having difficulty accessing the repo is able to um, open the code editor and then make another attempt at um, reading in the um, the repo. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. And yeah, if we could draft the chat to that repo again and have people um, just have that available. Okay. The other the other thing I can do um, is just share a link to the code directly. I think that might be. Uh, yeah, maybe you could share. Yeah. Is that that's another thing. Try to get the link right yeah, there. Yeah. 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 So that, that so the chat. Yeah, this is another nice fe uh, feature of Earth Engine. You can just use this get link button, copy the link, and I'll just copy it here in the chat. And you should be able to click directly on that link to see just this script. So hopefully that helps for those of you who aren't able to pull in the, the full repository. Okay, so yeah, for those of you who can't um, see the scripts in the repository, click on the link I shared in the chat. Oops, and I realized I just sent it to the waiting room participants, so I'll send it to everyone. Okay, try this link, and you should be able to open just that first script that we're going through. Okay, it looks like uh, Mike has been able to open the script. Okay, great. If any of you continue to have problems, uh, just t let us know in the chat. Okay. Otherwise, maybe you can continue, great. Yep. Okay, so now that we've seen what images that are available, we're just gonna start with a single image um, and I chose one in Soapfruit Saddle. This is one of our sites in California collected in 2021. And this site is particularly interesting because there was a fire and I may forget the year of the fire, John probably knows, um, but there was a fire before this year. And so there's a nice, um, there's some nice imagery showing the burn scar. And it, I guess nice in the sense of interesting, scientifically not nice that there was a fire. So I'll go ahead and comment out this next chunk of code from line 17 to 21. Um, and this is basically just pull, using some filtering properties based off the image to select certain things like the date of data that we're interested. In this case, we used filter date to select data only between January and December 2021. And so say you don't know the exact name of the image or the visit or things like that, you can always use this filter date to subset the data. And this is similar to how you would do it to, uh, or how you would subset satellite data as well. And then we can also filter on the metadata. Um, and here we have a property called neon site and that is the four digit neon code in this case, so fruit saddle. So actually before I run this, I'm also gonna print our, um, let's, let's see if this works. I'll print the SDR collection, or actually I can even expand here. So if you expand any one of these collections, we had previously printed each um, data set as a list up here. But if you expand and look at the properties, you can see at the top of this, all of the, uh, a number of different properties that we've included with the, with the data. So these are things like the visit number. In this case, we've visited the the site that I've selected, Great Smoky, twice, um, a description, the flight year, the data product ID. This will be the same for all of these SDR data sets. The data product URL, this clicks and goes to the data product page. I'll just show you real quick. It's opening up here. So this is actually the page on the NEON data portal that gives information about this data product. And we really encourage everyone to explore this before working with the data. And then we have other information here like the site, product type and, and so forth. 
and then we'll get into this information at the bottom, but this is the information pertaining to the individual bands. So the wavelength and full width half, half next of each of those bands. So when I'm doing the filtering here in this next section, all I'm doing is pulling out some of these properties to select a single image. And then the first at the end here just pulls out the first um, of, if say we pull out several images from this, this selects the first one. I know in this case that there's one, only one image that fits these criteria, but we still have to use that first so that it pulls out an image instead of an image collection. So when I run this chunk of code, which I just quick run at the top, you'll see it doesn't really do anything different than what we did before, because all it did is read in this variable and we didn't print anything else out. So we'll go through these next lines of code, uh, which will actually do something. So the next set or the next thing I'm doing here is just selecting three of the bands. And these are bands that correspond to the red, green, and blue um, wavelengths. And <clears throat> you could determine that by going into this bands and then um, actually, sorry, the properties. And you could pull out the information this way. So for example, band 53, you can see on the right here, corresponds to a wavelength of 644 nanometers. And so that's, uh, in this case, the red <coughs> portion of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. So again, I just read in a variable, but I didn't um, print anything or map anything. So I'll go ahead and uncomment the next line here. And Next, all we're doing is setting up visualization par parameters, and this is in preparation for uh, creating a map that will display in the map image below. So if you don't know the minimum and maximum values that you're, you're, you need to use, I can show you how to do that interactively coming up, but all this is doing is setting a range of values. And our reflectance data is, um, typically, reflectance data is a number between 0 and 1. It's a unitless value. But we scale ours by 10,000. And this is basically to save on the um, storage space so that we can store it as an integer instead of as a float. And so keep that in mind when working with data here. And you can also rescale by applying the scaling factor. But for now, we're just going to assume uh, or we're just going to use the values from 0 to 10,000. And the optimal values we're picking here are from 100 to 2,400. And then for the, another thing we have to do before mapping data is to tell the map where to center. And so here, I've just selected the Latin long of our soap root site. This zooms in on that area in California. And 12 is the zoom level. So you can play around with that as well. But it just tells you how big you want the map to display. And then finally, this last line of code is what actually adds a map to the image. And it's this layer. And so we're adding our RGB. This is our true color image that we've pulled out those three bands, the visualization parameters, which we called RGB biz. And then lastly, we can give a title. So this is SOAP 2021. And actually, this title should actually be RGB. Uh, reflectance imagery. So if I go ahead and run this, you can see the imagery pop up and expand this book below. So this is our reflectance data over soap root saddle in 2021. And then in the right, you can see this layers tab. If you click on this lock, it will keep that open so it doesn't keep disappearing. And you can click on this layer, click on the settings, and then you can play around with visualization parameters in here. So before, when I mentioned the range, that just sets the range of values to, to use here. And it looks a little bit dark here. So say you wanted to play with some different stretches, you could say 98%, apply, and that actually makes it look a little darker even. Let's try 90%. And this is just applying different histogram stretches to allow you to look at the um, imagery with different contrast, essentially. All right, so that was just a super brief um, intro to basically making a plot 
finding the, the surface directional reflectance data, making a plot and, um, and playing around with some of these visualization parameters. So hopefully everyone was able to follow along with that. Does anyone have any questions right off the bat? Feel free to pop them in the chat. Since um, for those of you who are not able to import the repo, the repository, um, you could save as the script, you could save as, um, sometimes the save button is grayed out and that's if you haven't made any changes to a, a script that you previously opened. So you just need to have, you know, make one minor change and then you have the save as uh, appear and you can save to your local uh, owner uh, repository. Um, and I think if you're only reading and you're, you've opened it up, uh, you're able to op open up from the repo, you would have to save any changes to your local repository. Good point. Thank you, John. So I'll go ahead and save. And the last thing I would just say in terms of trying to uh, brighten up the um, appearance, the visualization, you could play with the, the range of values there and, and maybe up the, uh, you could do it in the script itself or maybe change to custom and auto, alter them in some way, yeah. Right, so yeah, stretching by one sigma makes it too bright. You could try playing around with these different standard deviation histogram stretches. So this one actually looks pretty good. Three sigma, I think looks more realistic. Um, and so that would be something like zero to 1260. I'll go ahead and apply that here and you can see how that might change. So we'll go ahead and rerun. And then that applies those visualization parameters. And actually, I think for those of you who were able to um, get the repo, these changes, um, this is, I'm working directly on that repository. So all these changes and uncommenting will actually be saved to that repository. So you can um, come back to this exact script from this, from today. Okay. so. With that, we'll go ahead to the next lesson. And this um, this lesson is actually new this year, and it involves um, reading and weather quality information, which is now part of those extra QA bands. And then we'll use that information to get an idea of what the weather conditions that were during this particular site, um, when we flew over the site on the different days. And then we'll also mask out um, data to include only the good weather data, which is something we recommend everyone does when working with AOP hyperspectral data. Um, and so the lesson that I shared earlier and that John put in the chat on weather QA kind of goes into a little bit more written detail on this, then we encourage you to look into that if you're interested, but I'll try and talk you through everything um, here today as well. So I'll go ahead and share this script again for those of you who weren't able to get the repo to pull in and I'll put it in the chat. So um, yeah, again, you can just click on this link and it should open up this same script into your code editor. Okay, so we're gonna start at um, the one of the first steps from that last lesson just by pulling in a single image over Soap Root Saddle. Um, this time I'm pulling in an image from 2019 instead of 2021. And this is mainly because in 2019, we actually collected data um, in all three of our weather conditions. So actually I'll just take a step back real quick and I will, I'm going to uh, share that web page or the tutorial page briefly. Actually, I think it's in here. So okay. So this is that tutorial that we mentioned. And all I want to show here is um, this first image. 
uh, which basically shows that um, the different kinds of weather conditions that AOP collects in. So we, of course, always try to collect in less than 10% cloud cover. Um, but this isn't always possible because we have a tight schedule and we're trying to capture all of, not all of the sites, but many of the neon sites every year in peak greenness. And so this means we have a limited amount of time that the planes are deployed at each domain. Um, and so sometimes we get unlucky and have poor weather conditions the entire time, or we only get a couple clear weather days. And this means that we might have to fly in suboptimal weather conditions. So the figure on the left shows um, what we aim to fly in, which is uh, clear sky conditions. You can see here, there's a little bit of haze and it really comes down to a judgment call on the part of the flight operators on what they call the sky conditions. But in this case, there's just haze along the horizon and otherwise looks clear sky. So they might call this um, a clear a green, uh, we call it a green weather day, less than 10% cloud cover. The middle image shows uh, a flight over the Northwest where we had some cirrus clouds. And this is, this they called a, um, a yellow weather day or 10 to 50% cloud cover because of those high cirrus clouds. And then the figure on the right shows what we would call a red weather day where there's a lot of clouds, but they still had to fly because that was just the best opportunity they had. So this is really important for interpreting NEON's reflectance data because any clouds over the, the plane can obscure the incoming light source, which is the sun. And so that can affect the reflectance values um, just depending on how many clouds and, and, and where they were. Um, yeah, the cloud percentage. And so we try to relay this information as best we can um, into the final data product. So that information is saved in what we call a weather quality indicator band. And that's what this lesson is getting into. So again, um, we're just gonna read in this data from the surf first site. And then this next line of code, if you uncomment, I actually didn't mean to uncomment this comment. Um, we'll just print that to the console. And I showed this a little bit earlier, but what I wanna show now is if you scroll, in the properties down to the bottom of this long list. This shows all the bands of bands of data that we have. But if you go all the way, oops, and I realized I actually want to go into the bands. But if you go all the way down to the bottom of the bands here, you'll see that after band 426, which is our last data band, we have a number of bands called starting with aerosol optical depth. And then the second to last one is this weather quality indicator. So these last, I think there's 16 of them, 16 or so bands are, um, are all QA bands that include things like inputs and outputs to the atmospheric correction, and then the weather quality information and also the acquisition date, um, which may be of interest if, for example, you have field data that you're trying to match closely with or something like that. So what we're gonna focus on in this lesson is this weather quality indicator band. Okay, um, and before we do that, I'll just show you another way that, so it was kind of annoying to have to scroll down to the bottom here. And um, because I'm familiar with the data sets, I know that all of the bands start with, some, with B and then the band number. So 001 to 426. And then all of the uh, QA bands start with something other than B. So here, in this next line of code is just a shortcut that pulls out a regular expression to include all the B bands starting with B. And then if I run it, I can display the QA bands only in that way. So here now you can see it's zero to 15. So that shows just those QA bands. Um, so you probably won't have to do something like that regularly, but it's just one way to show you how to pull out a subset of information from the bands. And that's using this dot select feature in Google Earth Engine. Okay, so now that we know which band we're interested in, this next line is just gonna pull out the weather information into a variable called SOAP weather by using select, and then we can select just that band name. So similar to before where we selected, here we selected everything that doesn't start with capital B, 
Here we're just selecting the band that has this exact name. Um, and again, this isn't going to do anything since I'm just reading it into a variable. So um, another thing you can do, um, and more, and this information will be a little more transparent once AOP becomes a public data set, but the weather quality information is saved so that one the class one corresponds to the green or less than 10% data, two corresponds to yellow or 10 to 50% cloud cover data, and then three corresponds to red or greater than 50% cloud cover data. So anything that from this band that equals one is our zero to 10% cloud cover. So all we're doing here is just pulling out all the weather data from that band that is equal to one. And then we can use this update mask to, um, up, to basically to apply that um, that filter that we or the the all the pixels equal to one. We can apply that to our original SOAP SDR variable that we read in up here. So that's our reflectance data set. So we're updating the mask to only include data where the weather quality was equal to one, or in this case, the best um, weather data. So um, these next two lines of code should look a little bit familiar. All we're doing is selecting the true color image. I'll just type this out. Um, but this time using our clear weather data only. And then we can display it using the map.i layer. And then we want to center it. So I'll include that line as well. So if I run this next line of code, uncommented down to line 36, we can see the reflectance data from this time from 2019. It zoomed out a little further. Um, and this is only the clear weather data. So um, in the final section of this code, um, all I'm doing is showing, I'm creating a plot of all the weather data, but and colorized by using AOP's color convention. So we use that. Um, stoplight type convention where red is bad and, yeah, and green is good or green is go. So um, I'm creating a color palette here for green, yellow, and red. These are just hexadecimal codes for those colors, um, which you can find pretty easily on online. And then I'm applying that color palette to the soap weather data um, and, and making it a little bit opaque. So if I run the full set of code uncommented, now you can see if I unclick on the reflectance layer, this is just the weather information. So this area of the site was collected in green weather conditions. This is probably our priority one or highest priority flight box. And then other parts of the flight were collected in yellow and red weather conditions. And this is, so you can see here, this is just masked out to include only the good weather data. So you may not need to make this weather quality map every time, but I think it's a great way to visualize um, the, the, the full site and get more information on, okay, what were the conditions during the flight? What data is most value, valid to use? And then from there, you can work with that data, with that um, high quality data. And if you wanted just to, <clears throat> to play with this to see what it would look like when you um, filter out everything with the yellow data, you just need to go to the line um, 24. 24. Yeah. And then um, change that to a value of two yeah. equal to two. So here we could do that just for fun. So this is just. As John mentioned, this would just be the data collected in yellow weather conditions. Or ever it back for now. I mean, this really shows the the speed of Earth Engine in being able to display very large, uh, in this case, hyperspectral data sets very quickly and filter them out in, um, in ways that you want. So, um, you know, cloud environment is very, um, 
useful in that respect. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, if we were to an do- idea of the size of the data set, the hyperspectral data set as a whole, it may be on the order of uh, 150 of gigabytes of data. Yeah. Yeah, we could look at it. So this is this last data set. And here you can see it's 140 gigabytes. So yeah, quite large. Okay, so that was um, the main thing I wanted to go over with live coding, but uh, before we pause for to do the survey, I just wanna share this last script. Those of you who have downloaded the repo, you can click on this, but um, instead of going through this, I just wanted you to interactively explore on your own. So I'll go ahead and share this link. <clears throat> But this last one basically um, does the same thing where we're plotting in the, spec the true color image of the data, but we're also creating an interactive spectral signature plot on the left. And um, it's taking a little bit to run. So basically what this does is if you can click on any area on the map, on uh, at least in the reflectance data set, and it will, show you the reflectance spectra or the spectral signature of that um, pixel that you clicked on. And so this is kind of neat to look at. This is one, this is a site, as I mentioned, that burned, had a major fire, the, um, I'm forgetting the name of the fire, but it had a major fire before 2021. And if you click in the burned area down in the southwest corner of the site, you can see that spectral signature and how different it is from live vegetation. So um, on your own, if you wanna take some time and just play around with this, I think this highlights, um, again, some of the power of having this data in this cloud computing environment and um, interactively exploring the data set. Okay, we have a question. Can we export the selected reflectance profiles? And yes, you can. If you click this upper, if, if you click this little arrow in the upper right corner, you can say download and you can download it as a CSV or as an image here. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so we have another question. During the first script, a comment was made about the acquisition date, if you wanted to coordinate data. If you're selecting among pixels and areas to get certain cloud value, are you are these composite images like modus images from multiple dates? So yeah, that's a good question. And these data that we've imported are, are what we call level three data sets, which are mosaic data sets from different flight lines. And so the way we mosaic data are um, based off of a series of rules. And the first rule is we select the highest quality weather data. So if data were collected on two different days and one day was worse weather data and one day was better, it would only select the good weather days. And then we also select the nadir most pixels. Um, and so those are the two main rules. And then, yeah, to get the time span, so I can show you here, you could go into the, um, and we, we could do this as a separate um, exercise or tutorial, but you could read in that weather, um, or sorry, the acquisition date band, similarly to how we read in the weather band. But let me just see if I can find it here. So bands, if you scroll down to the, um, sorry, we have to go to properties again.
Oh, this is a, maybe this isn't the best. Here, I'll go back to the first lesson here. So I'm just gonna print the SDR call here. And actually I wanted to print the So I'm just printing the single image we've read in. And if I look at the bands here, this is all 442 bands, including the QA ones. If you go down to the acquisition date, or is it in the property? John, um, to find the minimum and maximum values of the data, where would that be? Well, I can show you a quick way. So if we go back, sorry, what? The pixel acquisition dates? Yeah, so if we, we can also look at it in the asset. So before, then you can navigate to this through that variable I, in the top. That should be in the bands. Um, I don't know if they will have access to this particular view of the asset um, until right. we have them in the, yeah, you can't look at the individual images. But oh, I think okay. it will be in the band. Right, it should be in the yeah. So it should show up. Um, and I can get back to you on this, but you can see the minimum and maximum. And you may not be able to see this yet, but once the um, data are publicly available, there'll be a better way to display this, I believe. But so here's I guess, I guess good explanation that there is an acquisition date property which will give you the date of the, the data set. I believe that's in there, is that correct? Yeah, this, so this one. And then there's a band, right? The band will be the acquisition date for each pixel. So, um, you know, we could have been flying over a period of two weeks. There could have been three different days um, when we collected data over the site and um, assuming those are the best quality pixels um, in the final data set, um, they could be of, from multiple dates. And so the each pixel might have a different um, acquisition date. You know, there might be three different acquisition dates contained in the pixels. And you could similarly to, yeah, pull this out here. Um, yeah, so you could do, so say we wanted to just show dates, you could do something similar to this. Yeah. Extract of the acquisition dates. And then you could plot that and then see the, the range of values or even just pull out the range of values from here. So if I do print, let's see if this shows anything now. Um, and it's always good to include what you're printing. So here, so dates. I mean, you may have to look at min or max. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure how, how that works on dates, but um, right. The um, you could display it then in some way, and you would therefore thereby be able to differentiate among the different dates in the data right. set. Right, right, right. Yeah, so we can add that. Well, after this, um, we can add that into this script even, and then you can look at the repo. And that may be important for people who are comparing um, the AOP data to satellite overpasses or maybe even some ground data that might have been collected. Yeah. So um, since I know it's almost the top of the hour, I'll just share the, um, I'll add this survey link for those of you who have to go. And we just ask that you fill out this quick survey um, about this tutorial. And then we're also or sorry about this webinar. And then we're also seeking input um, for future webinar offerings. Since this is the last one of this spring, um, for example, we're deciding whether to continue this webinar series. So any feedback you have is greatly appreciated.